Hello, Classic Rock fans. I am reporting just after getting home from seeing Eric Clapton across 24 nights at the Oriental Theater in Milwaukee. The Oriental Theater is Milwaukee's best movie theater, so it was a real treat to see a concert film from one of my all-time favorite classic rock artists on the big screen there. This sort of thing doesn't come around too often, so I really appreciate the opportunity to see this movie there specifically. But it does beg the question, why was this movie being showed? Well, if you didn't know, Eric Clapton has a new gigantic box set that is coming out uh, in a couple of months. I believe it's available for pre-order now. And it is the 24 Nights Super Deluxe Vinyl Box Set. <laughs> Super Deluxe. For those who don't know, Back in 1990 and 1991, Eric Clapton held two separate epic residencies at the Royal Albert Hall in London. In 1990, he played 18 shows, and in 1991, he played 24 shows. And they made a live album out of the second residency that was called 24 Nights. And for whatever reason, this year they've gone through the archives They've found additional material from both residencies, packaged it all together into three different sections of what will be one gigantic box set. There will be a blues set, a rock set, and an orchestra set. And you can get the whole vinyl set with Blu-rays of the concerts for about 200 bucks. You can also get some of these sections separately, which I did. At least I put my pre-order in for. And when they arrive, I will absolutely be doing an unboxing on this channel here. So stay tuned for that. So the point of the movie tonight was basically to drum up interest for this big release. So all across the country, tonight only, there is a movie called Across 24 Nights, which is more or less a sampler platter of some of the best moments from both residencies, 1990 and 1991. 17 songs, all considered, runs a little under two hours, and it played in theaters tonight. I don't know if it's going to get a Blu-ray or DVD release of its own, but I hope it does, because this gigantic box set that Clapton is releasing this year, that is very much meant for the dedicated diehard Eric Clapton fan. But if they release this movie that was shown tonight as a standalone Blu-ray, I think that would be very good material for a more casual Eric Clapton fan. So I'm not going to talk about the box set anymore. We'll cover that when um, what I purchased arrives. So I'll just talk about the movie tonight in case you didn't get a chance to see it and you want to know how it was. In short, it was very good. It opened with four or five super recognizable songs right off the bat. He opened with Crossroads, and then he did uh, I Shot the Sheriff, White Room. Uh, him and special guest Phil Collins did a cover of Bob Dylan's Knocking on Heaven's Door. And then I think he did Lay Down Sally. And that was a really strong opening. A bunch of super recognizable hits, again, very good for casual Clampton fans. From there, it transitioned to the blues section of the show, which featured special guests Albert Collins, Jimmy Vaughn, and Buddy Guy. I'm not a particularly big fan of Clapton's blues, but the stuff in this section was just fantastic. There are very few people on this earth who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Clapton when it comes to guitar playing, but Albert Collins, Buddy Guy, and Jimmy Vaughn are three of those people. So it was very cool watching uh, these guys all play together. Maybe the highlight of the show was Albert Collins and Buddy Guy coming out on their numbers that they played lead on because the energy really spiked. Because here's the thing about Eric Clapton. For all the talent that he has and for the amazing discography that he has for all the positives about him when it comes to Clapton performing live my god that man is a mannequin <laughs> and that's really my only criticism about his live performances doesn't move around a whole lot now he doesn't have to the music's still great I'm still enjoying the show but 
when you have someone like Albert Collins or Buddy Guy, who is playing just as well, but they're, like, all over the stage and, like, jumping around and dancing and busting out, you know, their, their rock moves, or I guess I should say blues moves, um, it stands in stark contrast. <laughs> I mean, both of those guys were so good when they were playing lead that everybody else in the band, Clapton included, you can all see in the background watching them. And they're smiling, and they're having a great time. And you can tell, like, this is also Eric's favorite part of the show. <laughs> because these are guys that, uh, you know, he grew up listening to, and he idolized, and he sees it as his privilege to play with them here on this big stage. And they don't disappoint. Buddy Guy in particular damn near stole the show. I should go see him, because I think he's coming to Summerfest uh, in Milwaukee this year. I have seen him before. I've seen him actually open for the Rolling Stones at Summerfest back in 2015. And what was great about that show is when the Stones played, they brought Buddy Guy out to jam with them for a little bit. And they did it on a song called Champagne and Reefer, and Buddy Guy made some comment about Mick Jagger <laughs> liking cocaine. Mick, I know you know cocaine. Which got a huge laugh out of the crowd. And it, it's interesting to have that memory and then watch this concert movie uh, with Eric Clapton because Buddy didn't say anything in particular. But they were shooting looks at each other, they were having all kinds of funny, and he made some little joke uh, at Eric, and then Eric stepped forward, and Buddy Guy and Eric traded guitar licks for a couple of moments, and that was just fantastic, because it's these two icons of guitar music, blues and rock and roll, and they're playing together, and it sounds awesome, and it's just uh, very fun to watch. And I don't want to sell Albert Collins short either. That guy had a ton of energy, too. So the blues portion surprised me because I was kind of dreading that because I'm not, again, the biggest fan of Clapton's blues. But these selections really worked for me and I think made for a better concert film experience. From there, the film moved to the orchestral part of the show. Now, this is really the big hook of the whole project. Clapton teamed up with composer Michael Kamen to do orchestral versions of his songs. And Michael Kamen is like elite tier composer. I'm a big fan of his work. He did the soundtracks for uh, a couple of the Lethal Weapon movies. In fact, him and Clapton did that um, It's Probably Me song with Sting for Lethal Weapon 3. Michael Kamen also did the score for the James Bond movie, License to Kill. That's my favorite James Bond score. So I'm a big Michael Kamen fan, and that was another reason why I wanted to see this concert in particular. So they did some of Clapton's songs that have this orchestral arrangement, and I wonder, is this like the first version of this? It's very common for classic rock artists to re-record their old hits with orchestras now. In fact, in my last podcast, I was talking about Wang Chung, and Wang Chung has even done an orchestra album. But I'm trying to think of an example that exists before this 24 Nights residency from 1991, and I'm... Nothing's coming to mind, so I'm wondering if this is what kind of started all that. But in any case, the execution is fantastic. They did a song from a TV series called Edge of Darkness, and I guess that is where Clapton and Michael Kamen met, or that was their first collaboration, something like that. I didn't know the track, but I was very impressed with it. And from there, Clapton moved back towards the rock part of his catalog with uh, Tearing Us Apart, which was a very fun version of that song. And that's 80s Clapton. That's the Clapton that I really like. 
which I imagine makes many people watching this groan, but whatever. Uh, then he played cocaine, and then it went back to the orchestral arrangements of Wonderful Tonight, Layla, and Sunshine of Your Love. And I will say this, I don't like the song Wonderful Tonight much at all. But Michael Kamen had this new keyboard metronome intro piece on it that was really beautiful, very lush. And it really took the song up a notch for me. So that was a nice surprise. That was a good example of how this orchestral arrangement can really add to a lot of these songs. I don't necessarily think any of these songs are better than the studio versions, but it definitely adds to them. And it's worth hearing if you're a fan of those original studio versions. Now, as a fan of Clapton's 80s work, do I wish that more of that discography was present in this film? Actually, no. Of course, I would have loved to have heard Pretending or No Alibis, but if I'm keeping in mind what the intention of releasing this specific concert film in the first place was, it actually wouldn't benefit the concert to add the stuff that I like, because I think what you need to do is try to appeal to the casual Clapton fan and include the bigger hits. So when it comes to that 80s Clapton output that I like, his inclusion of tearing us apart, that one was for me. <laughs> so I appreciate that at least. If that song had not been there, then I would have had a problem with it. But again, keeping in mind the casual Clapton fan, I would say the set list is pretty damn perfect. Now, it's only played for one night, so you might be thinking, what is the point of me reviewing this? It's not like this is, you know, coming to my town later on. It's not like I can recommend you go see it because it's done now. And I would say that's a good point, unless, of course, they release it on disc. But the other reason I'd want to talk about this is because, because this gives me an opportunity to pick up on a conversation I started in an older video of mine when I reviewed the Whitney Houston hologram concert. In that video, I talked about the frustration that some music fans have about artists who have either passed away or have retired or don't tour very much anymore, or maybe they just live in a place that doesn't get a lot of big music acts coming through. What options do we have to see our favorite music in live social settings without the artists themselves coming to town? Let's stick with Clapton for a moment. I've seen Eric Clapton in concert. He played Milwaukee's Summerfest back in 2010, and that is the last time he was here. <laughs> so it's been almost 13 years since I've seen him, and that bums me out because he's, again, one of my favorite artists. So what does a fan like me do if he's just not been around for a decade plus? Well, this is something. You know, uh, is it the same as seeing Clapton on stage? No, of course not. But it does at least start to scratch that itch. Seeing that music on the big screen is still awesome. And I just think as more and more classic rock artists uh, wrap up their touring for good, um, we as classic rock fans have to explore other options to seeing that music in a live or social setting to make up for the fact that we're not going to be able to see a lot of our favorite artists anymore. So all this to say, if one of your local movie theaters is showing a concert film and it's an artist you like, I really think you should check it out because one, the tickets will be quite cheap, two, it's not going to be very crowded. Today at the Oriental, there was probably about 30 or 40 people. And three, again, it's not going to be as good as seeing the artist live on stage. But like I said, it will 
at least start to scratch that itch. And you'll hear the music that you love. And you also at least get to feel up close because the cameras, of course, get all the best uh, visuals from the shows anyway. So there are some benefits to going to see something like this. So this video isn't so much meant to encourage you to go see this movie or buy this movie if it's released on disc or to even check out that box set he is coming. It's more to encourage you to keep an eye out at your local theaters for concert films that are coming to town. Maybe it's part of a film festival. Maybe you have a theater that likes to play older movies. Maybe you have a theater that's like open to suggestions. Movie theaters are always looking for different ways to bring people in, and if they know fans want to see music concerts, they might seek that out. Otherwise, if you're a casual Clapton fan, and this Across 24 Nights comes to DVD or Blu-ray, yeah, I would encourage you to buy it. I think it's worthwhile. It's a really good uh, selection of live material from a point in his career where he was performing at an extremely high level. This is definitely some of his best on-stage work. And then if you're a diehard Eric Clapton fan, I would actually not encourage you to buy this if it comes to disc. I would encourage you to, well, take a look over at that big box set that's coming out and see about buying the uh, DVDs or Blu-rays from that, one of the packages that includes those, because I think that goes a little bit deeper. That's at least what I did. So once again, when those records arrive, I will do an unboxing on this channel. So if you want to see that, please hit subscribe. And even if you don't want to see that, please hit subscribe. At least if you're a fan of classic rock, because if you're a fan of classic rock, I promise I've covered someone that you're a big fan of here. I do a lot of concert reviews. This is my first ever concert film review, but I do concert reviews of all the various classic rock shows that I've seen over the last three years. You can find those on this channel, and if you would like to hear a podcast about classic rock, well, you're in luck, because I host a podcast about classic rock. We've had a lot of fantastic guests on recently, so please check that out. Otherwise, you can find our social media links in the description below. So with that, thanks for watching, and remember, Clapton is God. <laughs> Keep rocking.